Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for the delay. We're just one minute, uh, so we're pretty good, pretty good on time. Once again, I'm Robert Pleasant. I'm the Director of Student Services and a member of the uh, Council on Diversity and Inclusion here at the Southern Campus. Um, this session is entitled Black Huntington, an Appalachian Story. Uh, just a reminder, we do have the chat feature available, so please feel free to write any comment uh, that you would like or question in the chat, and we'll be monitoring that throughout the session. Uh, I have a great honor to introduce a friend, a, a colleague, a mentor, uh, Dr. Cicero Fain. Um, Dr. Fain is a native of Huntington, West Virginia. He received his BA from the University of Hawaii and, and Manoa and a Master's of Education from George Mason University. He is the recipient of the Carter G. Woodson Fellowship uh, from Marshall University and received his master's and PhD in history from The Ohio State University. Uh, his teaching career includes positions at Marshall, Ohio University, and the College of Southern, uh, Southern Maryland. Uh, he has sev authored several articles in peer-reviewed journals, including Buffalo Soldier, Deserter, Criminal, The Remarkably Complicated Life of Charles Ringo in the Ohio Valley Journal. His first book, Black Huntington, An Appalachia Story, was published in 2019 uh, and was a finalist for the Appalachia Studies Association Weatherford Award. And in 2021, um, the West Virginia Library Association awarded it Literary Merit Award. Uh, in the fall of 2022, Black Huntington was chosen as the inaugural book selection for campus-wide uh, reading by Marshall University's Higher Learning Commission's Quality Initiative Committee. Uh, Dr. Fain uh, was recently appointed as the inaugural assistant provost of Inclusive Excellence and Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Fellow at Marshall. Uh, Dr. Fain, it is always an honor to have you and to hear you, and uh, we're excited about this presentation. So I welcome everyone, Dr. Cicero M. Fain III. Thank you, Robert. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Appreciate that generous introduction. Uh, shout out to my fellow um, a, a panelist. Um, and in fact, I have, I guess we want to call a panelist, my fellow presenters. Um, uh, this is shout out to my fellow, supposed to be all of you folks who listed Dr. Andrew Fight, Daryl Smith, Dr. Teresa McKenzie, Dr. Viella Grooms. Is that correct? Um, okay. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, shout out, thank you to Robert and the Council on Diversity and Inclusion and Eric Brown for helping me out uh, get these IT stuff squared away. We won't even mention, <laughs> we won't even mention, because <laughs> uh, I misunderstood stuff. I was on my way to campus um, before I realized that this is virtual. So uh, thankfully, I, I was, uh, God must have been interceded because I did, made me call and, and, and turn around. Um, so in any event, I'm happy, delighted to be here. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to really now I'm going to try my best to not to be too biased. Um, and, and that was, that was certainly a, um, a, a chore, a task, a, um, a goal as I was writing the book. Um, but I have, I have great pride in being a fourth generation black Huntingtonian. Uh, my great grandparents are buried in Bethel Memorial Park Cemetery uh, in Huntington. Uh, I've been an evangelist for Black Huntington ever since I started doing research. Um, and I consider Huntington, uh, Huntington's Black history unique and rich. And quite possibly, I can make the argument for a city its size, um, the most uh, remarkable history. Um, of black achievement uh, in this nation's history for, for a small black community. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why, um, and we can have a conversation about that. Would you mind hitting the next slide, please, Eric? Or can I do that? Is You tell me. I just tell me when to hit the next slide and I will. Okay, okay. So let me, let me start off with some historical um, uh, backdrop. Um, it's important to realize that that uh, Huntington was founded 1872, six years after the Civil War. It's actually founded after the state was formed. Um, and um, 
a number of black people had already come into the center uh, to, into the uh, central part of western virginia booker t washington used you see the red line detailing the uh thoroughfare the james river and canal terrapike virginia state road the chesapeake and ohio railroad used 60 um and midland trail then now i-64 you know the various iterations of this um eastern to western thoroughfare artery um migration path that uh, brought black people from central Virginia into Western West Virginia, and in fact, into Southern Ohio, um, where I will now ask for the next slide, please. Where we have, of course, many of you are familiar with Mission Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church, the oldest church west of the Ohio River, it is important to realize that this is the mother church for many churches throughout the region. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Nelson Barnett, Reverend Nelson Barnett would, would be one of the first pastors here. He will travel up and down the Ohio Valley as well as uh, Tug River Valley um, to spread the gospel and to help build churches. Um, and uh, he would also be one of the first pastors at the first uh, Baptist Church in Huntington, West Virginia, once it will be established. It's important to realize that this church, and I should also mention that um, the AME Church, John G. AME Church in Gallipolis, Ohio, is the oldest AME Church west of the Ohio River. And so we had a rich history in this region that is just now, I believe, coming into prominence by various stakeholders and gatekeepers and, and realizing that there's, we can tap right into and build and develop an African-American heritage tourism sector um, with the pieces that are in place, with the infrastructure that is in place. This Macedonian Missionary Baptist Church is the only church within the region that is part of the National Underground Railroad National Network. Um, I was um, part of the uh, a co-writer on that grant um, and I'm happy that I was uh, a participant in that process. And from here, I actually just gave a presentation last week to a bunch of stakeholders and gatekeepers in the convention, visitors and bureau um, and tourism sector within the state about this is how we can capitalize upon what's already here um, and build something that could be transformative. Next slide, please. So, um, I would argue that the most transformational development in the history of the state, certainly economically and culturally, would be the development of the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad, uh, which would go through the New River Valley, which, which, which would open up the coal fields, uh, which would uh, in, uh, entice um, Black migrants into the region, provide them gainful employment. Um, after the railroad would be finished, they would settle into the towns and villages and hollers associated with the, you know, near that in close proximity to the railroad. They would transform the nature of politics um, and the social cultural environment in the southern part of the state. Now, Huntington would be the, the transshipment point. Um, and Huntington was founded by, by um, Carlos P. Huntington as a transshipment point. And from there, um, it would blossom dramatically as a, as a economic hub, as a manufacturing commercial industrial hub, as a social cultural hub as well. And you see the affiliated development to the south of the Chesapeake and Ohio, which, which would be the Norfolk and Western Railroad. Those two railroads are gonna open up, transform Southern West Virginia. And for many folks, they're gonna travel to Huntington as, um, um, as the New York City of the tri-state region. I mean, there are also affiliated developments in. Um, uh, you know, in Ashland, in Ironton, all of these cities have the, essentially the, the same manufacturing industrial base. Uh, all of them are going to help to contribute to vibrant growth and dynam dynamism within the tri-state region. Uh, next slide, please. So we have John Henry. We know the story of John Henry, uh, the man who raced against the uh, the machine and uh, and lost, well, won in the process, but lost his life. Uh, more importantly is that John Henry's legend uh, myth would spread throughout 
the mountain south throughout central Appalachia. Um, black labor will be key to the construction of the CNO Railroad. At one point in time, there were 5,000 black laborers in close proximity to Huntington um, that helped build the railroad. Uh, I have real um, frustration with those folks who were champion Carlos P. Huntington without recognizing that he couldn't have done what he did without black labor. Um, next slide, please. So we have Huntington, essentially Huntington, the, the, it's important to realize that the first generation of black laborers, who black migrants who traveled to the city were in, more, in, in large measure illiterate, undereducated, um, but they, they had great tenacity, perseverance, aptitude, intellect, faith, and so they're going to build, they're going to lay the foundation to build the first Black institutions within the city. Th that, and the, the primary goal would be to gain, their primary goal was essentially, let's gain education. Let's, let's make sure that we get an education, we educate our children, but we also get jobs, gain, you know, jobs that will help us establish families, homesteads, and then we can move up the economic ladder. The primary goal was not to, even though West Virginia offered the franchise as, as incentive, in large measure, there were not enough, there was not enough critical mass. There were, the numbers just didn't make it um, sufficient to impact the political arena within Southern West Virginia, with the, really with the real exception of M McDowell County. Um, um, there were just not enough black people within Huntington within the urban industrial uh, situation to really impact the politics of the city. Um, Dan Hill is, I think, an exemplar of, of this upward mobility that Huntington provided. He is Huntington's first Uber driver. Um, and, and so he, he is able of 15 years after this, 10 to 15 years after this, he's, you know, he's running a taxi, but, 10 to 15 years after this, he's able to purchase his first house. He's now, I believe, a worker within the municipal uh, government, sanitation worker. But that's gainful employment. Um, and that's upward mobility. And that's what Huntington offers. Um, without, in large measure, um, the, the, the impediments and structures of, of harsh Jim Crowism that existed in the Deep South. Now, racism was there. There were occupational Impediments for sure. Black people were in large measure locked at the bottom of the occupational ladder. But the good thing is the growing diversification of Huntington's economy offered entrepreneurial activities for black citizens and residents. And so they were able to exploit those spaces and move up the economic ladder. Next slide, please. One of the as, as the, you have a developing affluence amongst the black resident population, you're gonna have the, a growing stratification between the black working class and the black middle class. One of, uh, and the black middle class is, is embracing in large measure the, the philosophy of racial uplift. If you engage in, in certain moral ethical behavior, uh, um, uh, founded in good Christian precepts, and 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 follow follow those guardrails to for aspirational uh, achievement. You you can you can move the race forward. Now the black working class didn't necessarily always agree with the black middle class, and that's the same in any community, uh, in large measure. Many of the black working class, you know, wanted to wanted to party, didn't didn't subscribe to the strictures of the black middle class, but. Um, but so I, it's important to illustrate that the black stratification within the black community um, was emblematic of what's taking place nationwide. Um, Professor Scott uh, was a was the vice principal. Let me take a step back. Nelson Barnett is the cousins to the Woodson family. We know Carter G. Woodson, Dr. Carter G. Uh, author, professor, educator, uh, publisher. Uh, 
think he's. Did we lose him? Cicero seems frozen on my screen. On yeah, oh, mine too. Yeah. Oh, that was, that was frozen. Frozen. yeah, it was frozen. It looks like he might be having a, a Wi Fi or uh, internet issue. All right, you look like he is. Did he get off? All right, got to make it back. That was good. There he is. You're muted, Cicero. All right, was that me or was that on your end? It looked like you, everybody else was okay on this end. So. <laughs> okay. But that was good. You're, you're good. This is good. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so uh, Professor C.H. Barnett was the principal. Uh, Barnett's, Nelson Barnett's son, one of his sons, was a principal at Douglas. And he and Vice Principal Professor J.W. Scott started a newspaper called The Spokesman, which in essence took a political bent. Um, uh, at this time, uh, blacks were 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 Republican leaning, and they they were getting tired of not getting the fruits of their labor from the Republican Party, and so uh, Principal uh, uh, Barnett, J. W. Scott, essentially said, you know, maybe it's time we think about shifting over to the Democratic Party if the Republican Party is not going to give us what we're working for. Um, and the school board essentially said, well, guess what? Either you cease and decease with this newspaper or we will fire you. Um, after some contemplation, the two men decided that they would not cease and desist. They were summarily fired and Carter G. Woodson would then be recalled back to Huntington, to Douglas High, to become the principal. Now, these are part of, I'm speaking of the racial uplift and, and, and um, uh, that, that ideology, the philosophy. This is what I think these maxims are still pertinent even today, 112 years later. Uh, have an object in view, be systematic, always pay cash, be honest, never borrow for small things, don't gamble, leave liquor and tobacco so freely alone, leave the simple life, Work as hard to save as to make, trust in God and keep busy. I think those are wonderful maxims for our students to, 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 to uh, be exposed to and in large measure follow. Thank you. Our ne uh, next slide, please. So I talked about the black entrepreneurial, this developing uh, economic sector based upon black entrepreneurship. And by 1921, we've got uh, eight contractors, six barbers, five hairdressing emporiums, four pressing and cleaning shops, three real estate agents, two shoe repair shops, two printing companies, one drugstore, and one movie theater. So Huntington's economic vitality is clear uh, to me. Next slide, please. I also forgot to mention there was the Black Hospital that Dr. That Dr. Um, that Reverend Barnett's other son, C.C. Barnett, started, um, called the Barnett Hospital. It will be one of only six hospitals in, in America accredited to train surgeons. Um, black folks from as far away as Florida traveled up to Huntington to to have medical procedures performed by Dr. Barnett. His wife, Dr. Clara. Not, not, not Dr. Excuse me, Clara Barnett uh, from Gallup Police. Uh, I cannot think of her maiden name, excuse me for that. But uh, she started a nursing school and it was accredited. And they trained nurses, she trained nurses from throughout uh, the region. So these are really amazing accomplishments given the fact that you had lived in an era of Jim Crowism and what we call it in West Virginia, benevolent segregation. Now, I talked about there was a sense of racial cordiality that existed in Huntington. And I think probably throughout um, much of the region, one of the ways that, considering that you don't have, you're, you're locked in at the bottom of the occupational ladder, um, you don't really have any political clout. And so the various leaders within the community decided, well, how best do we allow for the community or provide for the community to move up the economic ladder. 
And one of the amazing things I would suggest is that there was a vigorous interracial home ownership campaign led by black folks and white pastors to purchase lots and homes in the city to, to in, in essence, circumvent the structure of racism of the financial banking system. And what they did was they purchased 67 lots and homes throughout the city. And the Barnett family owns about uh, seven homes, seven properties. The Woodson's own a couple as well. And so what that does is it, it, it mitigates the need to establish building and loan associations or to go to banks that are gonna charge exorbitant interest rates and also um, adhere to restrictive covenants they're going to block people from where they want to live. So they bypassed all that. By 1924, 60% of Afro Huntingtonians owned their homes, a higher figure than either the Black residents of Clarksburg or Charleston. The aggregate worth of the Black real estate holdings was approximately $1,400,000, a significant increase from the roughly 400000 total worth cited by Professor Scott a decade earlier. Excuse me. Of the 483 homes owned by Black citizens, the average number of rooms per house was 5.5, while the average number of persons per household was 3.9, which was less than, which was um, higher than the 1.2 less than the city average. Excuse me, 1.2 less than the city average. So in essence, I messed that up, excuse me. What I'm getting at is that Black people were not living in hovels. They were not on top of each other. In 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 um, in a, a contrast to what was happening throughout the general population, there was evidence of a broad and deep affluence, affluency that existed within many of the black households that uh, and families in the city. Next slide, please. So, and I would say a testament of black affluency and economic vitality would be the development of black churches. So by 1930, Huntington is the largest city in the state. It has the second largest black population in the state. Remember, it's founded in 1872. So that is evidence of dynamism, vitality. Um, it should be said that, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, there is a, uh, a tram, trolley car that is going from Huntington to Ashland, to Ironton. And so folks, white and Fox, white and black, excuse me, who are traveling up from, from the coal fields of Southern West Virginia, um, towns and villages are coming to Huntington and they're getting a chance to not only experience what Huntington is offering, but they get a chance to travel to Ironton or Ashland. So we've got 10 churches that currently exist in Huntington, not all unfortunately operational, but at least you have an idea of um, of 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 an era in which spawn the, the economic vitality that have spawned uh, these churches, and all of them are still existing. Though the buildings are still there. Next slide, please. One of I spoke about what what makes Huntington Black Huntington so significant. Um, there's been a synergistic um, um, developments that have in the past few years that have helped to elevate. Um, black achievement and contributions to prominence. It's been a, it's been a city, it's been a school system, it's been Marshall. I think my book is is a contributing factor as well. But we have these are the various street names that we have. We actually have um, uh, Mayor Williams just added another one uh, over artist Billy Scott, I believe is his name. So I I don't know of any other city that has eleven streets. Name after black folk. Certainly not one our size, maybe LA, <laughs> you know, um, but certainly not one our size. Next slide, please. These are the various buildings, monuments, plaques, and, and a cemetery named after or dealing with black folk. Um, again, this is a testament to a unique situation, an elevation of black contributions.
Next slide, please. One of the other, I think, ingredients feeding into this elevation of Black Huntington, and it should be said, not only you know Carter G. Woodson, uh, Black Huntington, but also Black Appalachia. You know, all these there's 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 intersectionality between all of these these developments. Um, my colleague Bernice Morris wrote a book about Carter G. Woodson that that received great uh, uh, response. Uh, Ancilla Bickley um, and Linda Ann Ewan wrote a book some years back on Memphis C. Garrison. You folks should know that the Memphis C. Garrison house is in Huntington. Uh, she's a remarkable woman. And I, I, I never really knew that the truth of the matter is, even though I grew up in Huntington, like I said, I'm a fourth generation Black Huntington. I, I used to listen to these stories about Black folk all the time on the front porch. I, I don't recall hearing about Carter G. Woodson or Memphis C. Garrison growing up. Now, when I talked to my when I talked to my dad and other um, of his generation, they they will now talk about the personal stories or interactions that they had with Memphis C. Tennessee Garrison. Not so much Carter G. Woodson, but Memphis C. Tennessee Garrison, Hal Greer, and other folks. Um, and so now, what's going on is that we are within the county. There's a concerted effort to people that assert their accomplishments, their contributions, their stories into the fabric of our, of our society and to, and to our school system. Next slide, please. Of course, you know, you have mine. I got to pu push mine, of course. Um, so uh, I'm, I am, I'm gratified that the stories that I used to listen to on the front porch um, and which, you know, you had to be quiet. Those were the days you you, you sat quietly, and and some kind of way they stuck in the back of my brain my brain for all those years. And when I got to the point where I needed a topic for my PhD, I said, you know something, stupidly, I'll do Black Huntington. Well, lo and behold, there was enough there to make it worth work out. And uh, I've been really gratified by the reviews of the book, the contributions to the to the profession to the discipline. Um, and I've also learned a few things and, and um, that's part of the, the, the process. This book on the right uh, won the uh, Asala uh, National Award. It was the book of the year in 2022. Jarvis Givens wrote it about uh, the fugitive pedagogy and Carter G. Woodson. So this, what, is, what I'm getting at is, it's not just about the popular, it's not just the popular culture. There's a there's an academic foundation or or uh, um, portion of this as well component. The more we talk about Black Appalachia, the more we talk about Black Huntington or Carter G. Woodson or Memphis T. Garrison or or a Harlan County, Kentucky, or or South Carolina, these communities, it all is is bringing up the universality of the Black Appalachian experience, but also diving into the uniqueness of these particular experiences. And it helped, I, my, my overarching goal is to develop a sense of cultural pride in being a black Appalachian as an identity. Next slide, please. I talked about, the, even though they reverse this, Carter Jewison on the, on the right, there's uh, Dr. C.C. Barnett on the left. I already spoke about them. The, by, by the way, the C.C. Barnett, the Barnett Hospital is still standing in Huntington. Uh, we're trying to, well, I'll, I'll save that for later. Next slide, please. We talked about, these are musicians, Diamond Teeth Mary McLean, blues singer. Um, I think she passed at like 90. We now have a blues festival in Huntington named after her. Ravella Hughes was an international opera singer who traveled the globe under the, under the stage name, I think it was Carmela Duche. Um, she came back to Huntington and uh, became a music teacher at Douglas and started the music program at Douglas High School. Next slide, please. Hal Greer, 10-time NBA All-Star, uh, won the NBA championship, went to Douglas High. My dad was two classes behind him. My, rumor has it that my mom might have dated him for a hot minute. I could have been college, I could have been Hal Greer Jr., maybe Hal Greer the third, just maybe. Um, in any event. Um, 
we, we, the, the important thing is just as an affiliated development, talk about the synergistic efforts that are taking place. As part of the Sunbelt Conference, Marshall University now has, has, a, uh, has a mandate that they have to identify and celebrate two African-American persons or venues per year that they will then share with the other member schools. And so this year, they're highlighting Carter G. Woodson and they're highlighting Hal Greer. Um, and I was able to, to give the narration on Hal Greer. I don't think I put in the fact that he, it, my mom dated him, but I can't remember. Um, but they're gonna be displaying those narratives, those narrations on February 16th at, a, at the uh, basketball game. I think it's Georgia Southern coming through. Um, Herbert Henderson was a, just a giant, a family friend. Um, we now have the West Virginia, uh, what is it? Herbert Henderson Office of Minority Affairs. Uh, his three daughters are attorneys. Well, one just retired not too long ago. Um, president, 20 years of president for the NAACP. Just, just. Um, uh, I mean, the wonderful thing about growing up in Black Huntington is having these, these touchstones, these, these folks you could, you could aspire to, you see them and you say, wow, maybe I'll be a lawyer when I grow up. Or maybe I'll be an artist when I grow up. Or maybe I'll be an accountant or a doctor when I grow up. You know, you didn't have to, you didn't have to look over the mountain to see folk that you could emulate. They were right in front of you every day. That's a powerful thing when you're growing up. Next slide, please. Of course, we have Troy Brown and Randy Moss. Um, we're trying to get Randy to, to give a little, but at least pay attention to us and maybe come back and give a little something. Uh, that's a work in progress. Troy is already embedded in the community significantly. Um, but again, this is a testament to the, the, the diversity of talent that has come through and gone out of, of the community and, and, and affiliated, of course, with Marshall in these two instances. Next slide, please. We have Senator Marie Red. We had her first uh, state's uh, first black female senator. We have delegate. We currently have delegate Sean Humbuckle. Um, um, so we have this testament again of black achievement. In fact, I do believe there are only three black people in the entire state legislature, and Sean is one of them. Um, former student of mine. I'm proud to say. Next slide, please. Oh, and one other thing I forgot to mention. We, we have, there have only been two black state school, two black state school superintendents in the history of the state. Both of them have come from Cabot County. Joseph Slash and, and Bill Smith. So that tells you there's something pro incredibly progressive I would like to think uh, in Huntington, in Cabell County. Now, my current goal is to establish a center for African-American living history and culture in Huntington to help develop an African-American history, uh, African-American heritage infrastructure, tourism infrastructure, along with my, my, my buddy, Andrew and, and Marty, um, who, who are here. Uh, I can't see everybody, but we are working on establishing a, an African-American heritage tourism infrastructure. And I would suggest that the hub of that, and no disrespect to Daryl Smith or anybody else, because we, we, can, we can collaborate and partner, but the hub, hub of that would be Huntington. Uh, we have the resources, I think. We have Marshall University. And, and if we can get them to be a stakeholder, we could build something transformative. In a state of state of address um, about three weeks ago, Governor Jim Justice said that there was $1.2 billion in tourism that came into the state of West Virginia. And I guarantee you, if there was $100 of it devoted to African-American heritage and tourism, I'd be shocked. And so there is an opportunity here um to to transform not only the to increase job development 
economic development, but cultural her heritage and pride. To reverse a narrative that, we're, that West Virginia is not a welcoming state to diversity, to, to black people, there's an opportunity. And so I think people are getting that opportunity. And so here are some models that, that, um, that, that we're looking at to emulate in our living heritage, living history and heritage uh, concept. Um, I actually just brought a lady down, uh, president of the Ross Group, who they do museum concepts and design uh, work. Um, and so we are hopeful that we can find the, the, in, the donors that will pay her to do a museum conceptual design study, as well as a feasibility study to move us forward to at least have a groundbreaking of a complex by February, 2026, which will be the 100th anniversary of Black History Month. Next slide, please. So this is um, this is a, a, a model that we you know that we can uh, learn from. This is being built. Uh, I think it's scheduled to open this year. This is a center in Virginia Beach, uh, designed uh, I guess inspired by an African drum. Next slide, please. So my summary. Uh, Black Huntington's story is not one of grievance, sadness, or terrorism. Instead, it embodies the perseverance, resilience, agency, and progress of a population that made remarkable strides despite the barriers placed before them. One cannot tell the story of Huntington's rise as a regional, industrial, manufacturing, social, cultural, and commercial center without including the city's Black residents. There is not one world-class venue in West Virginia dedicated to the history, stories, experiences, and contributions of its African-American residents. From Booker T. Washington, to Henry Louis Gates, to Katherine Johnson, to Bill Withers. Now's the time to begin. Fairfield West is a place, that's the district that are primarily beating heart of Black Huntington. February 26th is the grand opening target date. Museum will be the epicenter of regional African-American historic sites, including Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church, Ashes Black History Museum, John G. Museum and Gallup Police, A.D. Lewis Center, Green Bottom Plantation House, Douglas High School, Barnett Hospital, Memphis T. Garrison House, and Bethel Memorial Park Cemetery. And, and I close with Huntington will never achieve its fullest economic and cultural renaissance until allocates appropriate resources to acknowledge, recognize, celebrate, and exhibit its unique and rich African-American history in, the, in, in whatever center, the name of the center we, we come up with. And so that's it. I thank you for your time and interest. Um, and I welcome questions. Are there any questions? I'll just start off by saying that's, that's powerful. That was a powerful presentation. I think uh, I've lived here in the area all my life and I'm hearing things I have never heard before. So thank you for sharing that, that knowledge and that information. Are there questions for Dr. Fain? You know I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> you are. <laughs> So first, thank you for telling me something I had no clue about. I have heard Carter G. Woodson Foundation over and over and over again. I watched Finding Your Roots, and it's one of the sponsors for that. Had no idea, no idea he was connected to Huntington, West Virginia, and this area. So thank you. My pleasure. My question is, you mentioned Dan Hill as the first taxi driver in 1905. Was he the first taxi driver, black or white, or just first? Now, I, I I, I consider him the first black one. Okay, first black one. Do you know how long he continued if his business grew or? Um, I don't, He, but he, I have him, he was one of the first black migrants into the city. I mean, he, he wasn't on top. I'll say he followed after the Barnetts and the, um, and the Woodsons. He okay. probably came in the late 1870s, early 1880s. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know much about his biography, to tell you the truth, you know, where he came from and things like that. Um, but I, I, I think you know, the Woodses and the Barnetts are, are outliers. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's important really to say that just because I didn't, my son or my daughter didn't achieve lofty heights, that they didn't make a contribution and that they didn't move, that they didn't have a, a, some success in their life. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And so to me, a black man who is illiterate shows up in a city and is able to acquire a job and then buy his own house is important. True. Um, and so um, that's why I kind of cited him as an exemplar of, of what Huntington offered. Yeah, I was just wondering if he was able to take that first taxi and grow it. And if there was a- No, he did not. You know, like, you know, no. Yes, uh -huh. he did not become, you know, Uber. <laughs> he did not grow that, the grow it that way. Uh -huh. Drivers here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was hoping he did. He took that and grew it, and now there was some- You know, the, 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 the most successful, I can make an argument that the most successful entrepreneur would have been Nelson Barnett. Oh, okay. Because he established not only the churches, but he established what we might call like an intervent, independent grocers association. Mm -hmm. And so he would travel from farm to farm and set up farmer's markets. Hmm. And that was one of the ways that they were able to, to raise money to build the churches. And so, you know, these were really, I would consider them ingenious people yeah. uh, who operated within the strictures of Jim Crowism. Um, who operated with the with the within the 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 challenges of being illiterate or under and undereducated, and in fact, it should be said, Nelson Barnett, he's going to come to Huntington, go to school. He's going to leave Huntington at a certain point in time. He's going to go to school in Ironton, because there's no black school at that time for him to go to. And so, I'm not convinced that his children. I want to say that actually, his oldest children might have gotten their education. Um, in Ironton or outside of Huntington, uh, it would only be later that we would establish, you know, Douglas Senior High School or Senior School, which would educate folks beyond um, the what the eighth grade or something like that. Um, and in fact, black people, there's a town adjacent to Huntington called Barbersville. Um, there were there were a resident there, and they would have to be bused over to Douglas to get an education because there was the only black school in the region to serve as black folk. So thank, thank you. you for your question. Thank you for answering. Dr. Van, I do have a question. In the book, you talk about the grapevine telegraph. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Explain what that. Uh, hey, Robert, I mean, thank you. That's, um, that has been, I think, probably yes. <laughs> Thank you, brother. That has been the most well, that has been the most well received chapter, I think, in the book, um, because it it goes a long way to to disrupting the narrative um, that that black people were complacent um, and and subject to the whims and the dictates of of the master class. We see at. at um, at White Sulphur Springs, what, what will become the Greenbrier Hotel, there was a, it was, there was a, um, White Sulphur Springs was a resort in which the Southern uh, elite would travel up to and spend the summers um, and uh, interact with other Southern elites from all walks of life. And there was also a, a, an enslaved population that serviced them. Um, um, they built the Grand Hotel, the Old White, which would, um, I believe, house one up to 1,000 guests in the dining room. It was a huge facility. Five presidents stayed there over the course um, of, of its existence. Um, but what is, it mar what, what is important to me is that the, black, the, the enslaved population that the, 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 the worked there, the higher slaves who were be hired out by their masters who would spend some time working there. The drivers who would drive their masters from, you know, the from the South, the, the invalid blacks, many of them were, some of them were invalids who their, their, their masters brought with them, um, as well as poor whites, all interacted with each other. And they knew the lay of, in essence, black people who worked there knew the lay of the land. This was an ecosystem in which they said, you know something? This is this is a better situation than working outside uh, uh, on the farms, um, working outside uh, in, in a much more harsher slave environment, and slave environment. And so they operated within an ethical, professional um, guardrails. They they 
they learn from each other, they realize, and they, they also realize that they could take advantage of the cash wage economy that existed there. Because if you wanted the best place to sit or eat, guess what? Give me a little something, something. I can make it happen. If, if you want to, for me to carry your bags, well, I'm happy to, ma'am. But guess what? I'm going to reach out my hand when it's all said and done for you to give me, to tip me for that service. And so they knew going in that this was an opportunity for them to exploit. And they did so. Um, and my that chapter chronicles the ways that they were able to um, circumvent um, the, the, the era, the status quo to, to benefit themselves individually and communally. Thank you for that. Thank you for asking, Robert. Other questions? Uh, not a question, just a comment. Uh, Dr. Fain, thank you so much for that information. Uh, hey, Craig, how are you? I, I'm fine. I was wondering if you recognize me. Of course, Spain, man. Come on. Come on. Each other yes. I have a lot more salt in my... <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I'm getting there too, so... I was just sitting here listening to all this information and recognizing a missed opportunity when I was there working in admissions because that was those, uh, that information was that anecdotal nuggets that you could give the families to let them know some unique things about the institution and about Huntington. And hearing all of this, I'm thinking, wow, I, I really missed out on an opportunity. Uh, but that's some great information that you shared. And, and, and like Dr. McKenzie, I learned a lot just from hearing it. And I my, my I'm happy. I'm happy for it. I mean, the truth of the matter is we didn't get exposed to that. As far as I know, we didn't get exposed to it. And so I, I am I'm just so humbled and proud to be a vessel um, to stand on the soldiers of these folks and, and, and help spread their word, you know, be a griot. Uh, to be a vessel, whatever whatever term you want to use, to spread the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. And I do believe, and I, tru I truly do believe that we're on the cusp of something transformative within the African-American heritage tourism sector. Yeah. Dr. Cicero, this, uh, this, this, um, this whole event is about sharing history and the important and why why we need to do that. So I'm gonna ask you the question I asked earlier today is, you know, why is this important? Why do we need to um, to share this history? Um, yeah, why is this important to, to know? Because we all need the, we all need to know it. I mean, it's, it is, how can I say this? So many on both, so many people just don't know it. You know, both white and black because it, we just haven't been exposed to it. And, you know, implicit in my in my evangelism, let's say, is that sure, my my purpose affiliated with you know job development, economic development, is recapturing a cultural pride that I that compelled me that that propelled me to believe I can do any damn thing I I put my mind to. And so I go out there and I don't want to get emotional about it, but I have the second black uh, school superintendent, Bill Smith. He was a high school teacher of mine. He gave me a card on my graduation that said, if you can dream it, you can become it. Now, you know, at the age of 18, so what? I don't, you know, I, 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 you take it for a grain of salt. But I tell you what, I still have that card. Um, I still see that man, and every now and then I will remind him how impactful your belief in me was and is. And so this is not just some kind of academic exercise. This is a personal mission. And um, I think we all can benefit and learn from it. You know, African-American history is American history. That's right. And we have to we have to elevate it to some level of prominence so that I I, I, I want to hear the white Huntingtonian go out to Myrtle Beach and say, you know something? I'm from Huntington, West Virginia. Do you know we, that's the home of Carter G. Woodson? Then I have done my job if that happens. 
So, and I also want to hear, uh, as as Dr. McKenzie said, I want to hear that black person say, I, I, I was actually down in Montgomery, Alabama at the Asala Conference um, in September. And I at a, pan, at a panel, and there was, you know, 100 people there, 200 people there. And I said, uh, hi, my name is Dr. Cicero M. Fain III. I'm from Huntington, West Virginia, the home of Carter G. Woodson. And I guarantee you, if five people knew that Huntington was the home of Carter G. Woodson, I would have been shocked. And so it's really just about me trying to do the best I can with other stakeholders, other foot soldiers, spreading the word. Ooh, any other comments or questions? That was good. Anything else? So I, I want you to get your pitchforks. I want you to get your, what is it? The, the torches? Let's go out. <laughs> <laughs> and do the work and do the work. Do the work. <laughs> That's it. So Dr. Fain, thank you again for sharing your expertise and knowledge with us. As always, I'm I'm always honored to be in your presence and to, to speak with you. Uh, just a reminder that we do have an evaluation, if you could complete that in the uh, in the chat there. Uh, and then our next session, uh, silencing of civility with Dr. Viella Grooms begins at 2:30. So uh, uh, we hope that you can attend that. But Dr. Fain, it was it was just a great presentation, conversation. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank did. you. Thank you for, thank you. Oh, all the best to everyone. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have a great rest of your day and see you at 2.30.